Hey guys, Rod here at A Better Way to Farm on a beautiful evening. We're just sitting outside enjoying the little bit cooler temperatures and some sunshine. We have kind of a unique situation tonight in that we have um, our whole families here. All four of our children are happen to be at the house tonight and we're getting ready to go eat dinner together. But uh, Karen thought it was a good idea to talk about why nitrogen management matters and we're going to talk about some of the other things, some other issues around that. We're going to start with some questions that we were sent and I'm going to um, take one from Kelly first or multiples. Uh, before we get started, I want you guys to understand that it is very rare. I have uh, four children and my oldest one is home. This is Kurt, Dr. Kurt Levesy. And uh, Kurt is our eldest. He's a, a PhD. He loves doing research of all types and is pretty passionate about nitrogen. So I will say this. Uh, Karen told us her preface was you can't get too radical. So we're going to try and tone this down to keep Karen happy. Uh, no promises, but we'll do the best we can. So let's jump in here. Kelly said, what about using Guardian as an end stabilizer with the Y drop? And if it matters, do we need to use it later in the season? And Kurt and I are going to kind of have a discussion and possibly even a disagreement or two here. And that's kind of one of the hard things about in management is that there's there's a lot of opinion involved, even though they have facts. Kurt, what do you, what's your take on using Guardian as a stabilizer when we're wide dropping, obviously later in the year? So, unfortunately, I know that guys are probably looking for that quick, easy answer that has the you know sort of blanket <laughs> approach, and that doesn't exist in this case, especially. But the answer is it depends, guys. So, any let, let's take let's zoom out a little bit and look at this from the broader perspective of when do we use a nitrogen stabilizer and which one and there are several factors that come into play there what's the weather doing right now and, and more importantly really what does the weather look like it's going to do so and, and what crop stage is another thing we want to talk about and which stabilizer so the sort of decision tree that i take my guys through is think about it like this you need to ask yourself what's my major concern or source of loss so if you look at that 10-day forecast and you can see, hey, we're gonna get rain every single day for the next 10 days, most likely, then there's no reason to use a, a urease inhibitor, like a, an agritain or an NBPT, right? Because the, the mode of action, the only thing that's doing is preventing uh, volatilization, losses due to volatilization. You're gonna get plenty of rain, that's not a concern. So on the flip side of that then, if you are talking about guarding, which is not a urease inhibitor, it's a, a nitrification inhibitor, then fundamentally what we're concerned about is, you know, are we gonna lose it to nitrification or denitrification? Um, and if you have adequate rain coming, that's something to be concerned about. But if there's no rain in the 10 day forecast, if it's been super dry, if we're early on in the plant's life cycle, you know, so we don't have row shade, et cetera, then our concern needs to be volatilization. So Guardian is not, it's a matter of using the products the way they're supposed to, you know, or they're designed to work. So Guardian is not designed to prevent volatilization. So if we're doing it when it's super hot and dry and it's early in the plant's life stage, I don't think we're gonna see much of a benefit there. With the caveat, and I know Dad will probably talk about this a little bit, uh, there may be some added benefits down the road. But the thing that no matter what stabilizer you're looking at, you always need to ask yourself, what is our major source of loss we're concerned about and what is the mode of action that, that the stabilizer itself is trying to accomplish? Sure, and you know, and the next thing that Kelly asked, because it was kind of a multi-pronged monster here, but he said, is there a difference in plant uptake in the two different forms, ammonium versus nitrate? Actually, a corn plant will take both forms in. It will it will yield the best when given a 50-50 mix, and that's pretty well documented. A lot of university, uh, I assume it was grad students working on a master's or a PhD, Probably. have documented that numerous times. And so that's well documented that you need a 50-50 mix. I mean, the plant will take up pure nitrate but it's going to convert right. part of it back to ammonium, and therefore that plant is wasting energy Correct. in the conversion process. And so my caveat on should I use Guardian, I'm inclined to say, do I need it from the standpoint of nitrogen loss? Probably not, especially late in the season, especially if I'm wide dropping at V12. Right. However, I may get a yield increase simply because I kept that 50% that was not in the nitrate form, I kept it out of the nitrate form. Therefore, that plant got exactly what it wanted and could better make itself just reproduce as opposed to have it just only working to convert the nitrate back to the ammonium form. And let's not forget too that there's also <coughs> animal research that shows that when you have excessive nitrate available, 
uh, you actually increase the incidence of disease pressure in your in your crop potentially. So there is some benefit there to keeping it in the ammonium form. And guys, you got to remember that this is not about. I mean, there are certain stabilizers out there, and I'm, I'm not telling you this to rip on any of them. But there are some when you get into like the polymer coated ureas, less so with the sulfur coated, but like the polymer coated. You can actually at that point have your nitrogen in a form that is not available to the plant because it has a polymer coating, plant can't take it up. Right. I tell everybody, you gotta remember, think I've got a three and a half year old, some of you have seen Elijah, um, you know, think Sesame Street. Your corn plants are not the, the cookie monster, right? They don't eat, they're the count, <laughs> they want to suck it up, they want to drink it up. So a polymer coated urea, you may need to be concerned about the plant not being able to get it. However, something like Guardian keeps the plant in the ammonium form of nitrogen, which the plants can still take up. So it's never like it's gonna make it unavailable to the plant and excess nitrate can cause problems. Right. So. Yeah, that's one of the people say, well, what if you hold it too long? We don't hold it, we just keep it in a certain form. And therefore, it cannot leach away as a nitrate if we right. don't let it turn into nitrate. And so, our answer, our short version is, is a lot of nitrogen management, they're not hard, fast answers on. The answer is, it depends. It depends. And on this particular deal, we ourselves know we need some research saying, what would be the appropriate rate of yeah. our guardian at V10 or V12? Because Kurt and I together agree on this, and we've ran hundreds and hundreds of plots. He started doing plots when he was about 10 years old with me, and then he went off on his own. He's done hundreds of plots on his own, as well as working with us. And in our heart, we firmly believe that it's a reduced rate. Probably about a third of the label is all we need to hang on to that. I think so. And again, that's, the label is the label for a reason, but this is not something that, that Conklin has tested in this particular application. I mean, keep in mind, guys, the way that Guardian is tested is it, it assumes that you're going to go out and side dress in between the rows and so the plant has to actually work to you know has to hold it there the plant has to grow into it it's in the soil there's a lot of variables i, I think if if they or the farmers would run tests i'm pretty confident you'll find that about a third of the labeled rate is is going to be probably Solution. where you wind up yeah so the last thing and kelly this is your last question for the day we're going to shut you off now but kelly wanted to know kurt what do you think about is it better to have in and boron together versus in alone from a plant uptake standpoint, I don't know of any data that says anything one way or the other. However, just intuitively, your mobile nutrients guys, nitrate, sulfate, and boron. So to me, you should never be putting nitrogen on if you're not putting sulfur on. And then I guess, you know, logical extension there, if boron's mobile, why not put the boron in with it? Right. The other thing you're gonna get is, um, you know, things like uh, mm -hmm. test weight and, and fill, uh, kernel fill, uh, oil content when we're talking about something in, you know, in soybeans, it, a lot of the things that, that make, the, that, that really drive those are your mobile nutrients, nitrogen, boron, and sulfur. So it just makes sense to keep those together, in my opinion. Absolutely. You know, you touched on, uh, Kelly was talking about the different things for stabilization and what should we do. And guys, uh, Kurt and I do not agree on everything. As a matter of fact, we probably disagree as, as strongly as any two people you'll see on some issues. And, but the, the bottom line is this. When we say for you to apply nitrogen, you can just assume we mean 28004, 3002. In some capacity, we want to see nitrogen that is applied with sulfur always. Yeah, I mean, and, and the thing is, is we always talk about like a 10, like the 28005 is more even than obviously than, than a 10 to 1. And, and I don't know that we've really tapped in the upper limits of what that looks like. I know Jason Mock has done some great research and uh, suggest that the later that you go in that corn's, uh, in particular in corn's life cycle, um, the more you need to make that ratio, not necessarily one to one, but like early you might want a 10 to one nitrogen to sulfur, whereas later on it may need to be an eight to one or even a five to one. And so I think that as that life cycle progresses, you, you probably need to make that closer to one to one. Exactly. And so we're big on the sulfur. We love ammonium thiosulfate going on together. I think that's a great idea. Jared had asked us, he wanted to know about do nitrogen stabilizers on dry urea work and which ones? And I'm gonna take this, Kurt and I kind of preemptively went through what we were gonna do here. And uh, we appreciate Jared a lot. Jared is my poster boy. He's got my video as to, uh, you know, we can come up, there, there's 10 good reasons to use anhydrous, Kurt, and of course I'm not gonna go through all of them, but let me say this. The Time out, we are gonna disagree. Name <laughs> one. <laughs> hey, the number one reason to use anhydrous is you cannot make methamphetamine without it. All right, somebody's got to be a source. Uh huh. All right, there yeah. you go. You can't argue that. No, I can't. So I Jared can't. is my poster boy because it's his video where the uh, hitch come off and the breakaway safety deal didn't break away safely and the hose busted. And so he applied an entire tank of in with the hose doing this number. And what it did was it just kind of created a crater and it looked like ash 
ashes Ages. like he'd had a big fire. And uh, that was three years ago. He still can't grow anything there. That doesn't so he is my poster child for okay. why you wouldn't want to do that. But we'll come back to that another day. So he wanted to know about this on dry urea. Here's the deal. There are about 15 or 18 nitrogen stabilizers on the market. And if you read their data, if you read their fancy, brilliant, beautiful four-color cell sheets, three of them work. The others, the other dozen, cannot come up with data to put on their own sheet that shows that they work consistently. Now, I'm not even going to tell you what three they are because we work with our company and we like our product. However, let me say this. Yes, guarding impregnated on urea is a winner, plain and simple, because urea typically goes on pre-plant. And so therefore we want to be hanging on to it. Now obviously if we're applying urea over the top, agrotain is something to think about if it's going to okay. if it's going to be dry. But I'm going to suggest that if our entire nitrogen management program is to broadcast cast dry urea and not incorporate it, we need to relook at our whole program. Would you agree? I would. And the other thing I'd add here too, guys, is uh, I guess I work with some growers up in the Red River Valley up in North Dakota, and up there guys occasionally will like strip till urea in. And here's the thing, if you're gonna do that in the fall, I, I actually don't have a, a big problem, you know, do a fall, if you're gonna do a fall applied nitrogen, doing it banded so that it's stripped, and doing it, um, you know, with urea. Again, never anhydrous, we joke about that, but seriously, never anhydrous. But if you're gonna do that in the fall, I absolutely would not use urea without something like Guardian. Absolutely. Because you need to keep it in that ammonium form so that you don't, so you don't lose it. So again, you, you move, it's kind of like the deal with the white drop, guys. Your stabilizers always, 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 it's, you know, what is our major source of loss? What's our source of, source of nitrogen? And, and what are we you know, concerned about? So if you're, like you're talking about, if you're gonna do it in the spring as a broadcast application, leave it on top, a little different deal, you need to look at, at Agritain. But something like uh, fall strip till, Guardian would be a great fit for sure. And if it's incorporated, I think it's another good fit. Yes, yes. Um, Joe asked us to talk about what test weights are you seeing with reduced in. And let me preface this by saying, Kurt, you work with a grower in the Dakotas who's probably consistently using the lowest in rates of anybody that I know. What's he getting? Every every bushel of corn is requiring how much in? Well, so for the last, he's tested this for the last three years, and they're running an average of somewhere between 90 and 110 pounds applied total. That's total applied nitrogen, guys. Um, and with that 90 to 110, they're averaging, depending on the year, 180 to 210. So call it an average of 200. So right at about 0.5. Mm -hmm. But again, the, the question is always, how are we doing that? Because it's sure as heck not with fall applied nitrous or over the top urea, right? It's, <laughs> it's all about banding and timing. And now this year, uh, they've been so wet. I know that he and I talked and he's thinking that they want to run a little more in the two by two, which is totally understandable. But um, when you're able to do that for three years in a row, um, obviously that's gonna more than offset anything that happens like if you do end up with a, a wet year and you have trouble doing some wine dropping. I've probably, and I, you can share your opinion here, Kurt, I've probably seen more test weight reduction due to too much in than I have not enough. Because we know that when we get too many nitrates into the plant, we run into health problems, we run into standability problems, we run into disease problems. And that is just the beginning of the end because then we don't finish strong. And if we're going to, you know, the bottom line is if that corn crop is not still green as a gourd when it's at 21% moisture, we have a problem. And other people want to, they want to argue that, but the fact of the matter is a corn should dry down, not die down. And if we're going to have dry down, we have to have appropriate forms of nitrogen in the appropriate amounts, and we're going to make sure that plant stays green up to the bitter end to the last possible minute. So if we're talking about that, I still, again, this is like reason number 37 why you wouldn't want to do fall applied <laughs> most nitrogen forms. But I heard Dr. Fred Bilo say one time, and obviously his deal is, you know, a great agronomist, especially as it comes to dealing with weeds. Um, I would argue he's better with weeds than with some of the fertility stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but with the weeds, he said, uh, a weed that doesn't emerge can't become resistant, which is, Totally true, it's actually kind of profound when you think about it. And in the same way, I, I have adapted that and I say nitrogen that isn't applied can't be lost. <laughs> and so, you know, everybody freaks out and they say, well, look, you know, we gotta get it on. I'm not like fully the checklist mentality maybe, but where it's like, okay, but if we get a wet spring and we can't get out there, then we're hosed. Well guys, if it's so wet that you can literally never get out there, what do you think happened to the fall applied stuff that you put on? So you can always ultimately get out there with an airplane or you know, theoretically you should be able to get out there with the wine drops. But I understand there are instances where that's an issue. But you know you can always come out there with a, a late application of urea. And we've got some guys down around Missouri that have done that. Uh, I know Derry did that one year and saw a, a great response. 
by flying some urea on late. So it's really about risk mitigation. And the earlier we put that nitrogen on, the longer we have that window open where your nitrogen is exposed to risk. And I know we've been talking about the stabilizers and those are great, but fundamentally we can make up a, we can cover a multitude of sins just by getting the timing right. So I, I'm gonna go ahead and we hadn't talked about this, but I'm gonna share sort of my ideal program with guys on strictly on the nitrogen side. Um, simply because this is what guys like Scott do, and this is where you're coming in at about a 0.5 um, you know, pounds applied per bushel produced. So always starting with the two by two, because again, there's no reason to have too much on too early, but you're putting some right there where the corn plant can get to it. And I'd say really no more than about 40 pounds of actual nitrogen, because there's no reason for more than that. And then we would put the remainder on through the wide drop with either one or two shots, depending upon where you're at and what you're doing. Um, and again, my goal would say, okay, what's a realistic yield goal? So if we're shooting for 200, uh, we're gonna shoot for about 0.5 pounds of light per bushel produced. So we take that 200 times 0.5, puts us at 100 pounds of total nitrogen. If we put 40 on with the planter, that leaves us with 60, that's what you need to come back and wide drop. And guys, you can think I'm nuts, but I have multiple growers who've done this very thing using that kind of a formula. And if you say, well, we couldn't get out there and wide drop, again, we can go back to the plane option, but we need to start with banding our nitrogen early where the plant can get to it, and we can come back and we'll band it again through the wide drops, and we're in good shape, and that's super efficient. And I am going to give a caveat because some of you are sitting there going, dude, I am not set up for two by two on my planter and I farm gumbo. I can't do the coulters. There, there are some situations. We help guys tailor make this. Yes, for sure. simple, Kurt. Yep. And so for the guy who says two by two is off the table, my next choice would be, all right, fine. Let's do 40 gallon as a weed and feed. It's not quite as good as a two by two band. I totally agree with that. Did you say 40 gallons or do you mean 40, 40 pounds? pounds? Like you just spoke, I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. 40 pounds. Like, don't give me a heart attack. 30 to 40 pounds as a pre-emerge weed and feed with yep. pre-emerge chemicals in lieu of that two by two band. And then we're gonna come back with the wide drop yep. and apply it at that shot. And wide drop's one of the things that Kurt and I had huge arguments over. And I have to tell you, it's very rare that I'm wrong, but. <laughs> <laughs> Hey guys, all of you should have a kid go to college. Yeah. He was a sophomore in college when he called me with that moment that I absolutely cherished and I didn't tape it, but he called me up and he said, Dad, you were right. And I was blown away. Yep. So send your kids to school and they'll figure it out there about the <laughs> second year. But anyway, we, we really did. I was a hard sell on this whole wide drop concept and Kurt brought me the data and he did the test and spent thousands of dollars showing us why and it is the best way to go i firmly believe it, it a lot of people don't know this i actually <laughs> i still have the email to prove this by the way i uh emailed greg Souter right mm -hmm. when 360 was becoming the company because john prowzel is one of the guys that i work with up in lisbon he and i had done the research prior to even knowing that 360 yield center existed as a company right and so i brought research to them uh, so wow. i was i was a i was a believer and a, and a strong supporter of them early on a lot of the research that you see cited on their literature is stuff that I either did or found for them. Uh, because again, I'd, I'd just as soon as that, that system came out, it was it was a no-brainer to me. Because the problem is, guys, I wanna, I wanna back up a little bit real quick. Because side dressing was sort of the old go-to before mm -hmm. uh, Y-Drops came along. And so the, the question that really got me started down the whole nitrogen research path was, okay, how does nitrogen move? And we, I think we blanketly assume that when we put it in and it kind of flows through the soil. Right. And so I decided to test that assumption because at one time, Dad, everybody knew the world was flat too. Right. Uh, and then you put that to the test and things turned out not the way that maybe they thought. So we started pulling soil samples every three inches all the way across the row. And the universities would tell you, and even the labs, and I'm not knocking the labs or the universities, but they say, mix it all up and send it in. That's great if you want to know how many pounds of total nitrogen you have applied, but you have to understand what are the assumptions inherent in a soil test. Well, it assumes that this represents uniformly the entire soil profile. And the assumption that I had was that might not be true. So when you send those cores in individually and you're looking at something that's been side dressed, what you find is, and we track this, like they side dressed and then we would track it for the next few weeks following, it doesn't move very far laterally at all. I mean, we're talking like maybe three to six inches. Wow. So if you're at, right out here in the middle of the row, 15 inches away from your corn plant, and it's only moving, you know, three, four, five, six inches out on either side, those plants, you know, the roots are growing down. The night, so there's, a, there's a, a time period where that nitrogen is really susceptible to loss and it's not going to uh, be very economically efficient for you, the grower. So in studying that, I thought, man, it just makes sense. If we put it where we need it, then we can use a lot less of it. And that's why when guys come to me and they think that I'm crazy by doing this, you know, 0.5 or even in some cases 0.4 pounds applied, it's all about timing and it's about placement. And when we do that, you can, I mean, I'm not worried about losing test weight. I'm more worried about, you know, what did he say, test, what test weights are you seeing with reduced in? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not worried about reduced test weights. I'm worried about reduced profitability. 
And you guys, I'm telling you, when you put on too much nitrogen, you reduce your profitability. And so when we can change that mindset of rather than what if I you know, give up a few pounds in test weight, I can't even tell you I have any research that shows that people do lose it. As long as they're doing the right kind of system, which again is, is placing it where the plant can get to it and not making it work for it, Again, I'm more concerned with, with reduced profitability by excess nitrogen applied. And so the bottom line was, I believe that when we applied that at the center of the row, 15 inches, yep. that we had basically almost lateral movement. Right. And right. I figured by the time it went down three inches, it had went out 15. The reality is, it went down 15 and barely went out three. Bingo. I had it exactly backwards. And Everybody so it does. isn't, it's not that the nitrogen goes to the roots, it's that the roots have to intercept it and they have to go to yes. that band. So the roots actually have to grow laterally at least 12 inches in a 30 inch row to get interceptions. Yes. And so that can be difficult, yep. bottom line. And so that is the deal. So yeah, that was, it's just some of the thoughts, guys. I, we don't wanna top a bunch of your evening here. I, we could sit here probably and talk for a really long time. But if you got some questions, hit us up. We'd love to have a message here on the Facebook page. We'd love to get a text. Uh, we'd love at 641-919-1206. Or, uh, and if you're interested, maybe we can do this again. You let us know what you'd like to hear us talk about. And we can sit down and try this one more time. And we'll just go ahead and cut you guys loose. I know that uh, it's a beautiful evening, and I hope you have a better tomorrow.